Whenever we live in the the life of the spirit and the realm of spirit, there there's freedom. You know, there's a liberty. There's you know, we're not bound by um, just external things that really can suppress and actually hinder us. But but when we when we uh, really open up ourselves and yield to the spirit. Um, and, and that's really the life of the spirit. It's not this kind of, you know, crazy cuckoo, just, you know, living in the wind. But, you know, it, it actually it impacts real life and real decisions and and things. And and uh, and so it is a, a blessing to be a part of a, a family and a body that um, embraces uh, the reality of the spirit and the flow of the spirit and and. Um, and I'm just so, so thankful for that because that's rare, you know, I mean, that's not a given, that's not an automatic. And I'm finding more and more uh, as I live as Christian, um, which, you know, is one of the things that I just feel impressed to put before us even today that, you know, a lot of times we, um, even sadly, the best of us, we sing and we preach and we teach and we profess way higher than we actually live. Wow. We do. And, um, and I don't want that to be the case, you know. Um, and I don't think that it has to be the case. And in a lot of ways, that really is the very heart behind that song that we sang, um, A Broken Spirit and a Contrite Heart, which I believe uh, even at the end of the service or the message or whatever, um, that we'll sing that again um, after having heard God's word. Um, and, and, and maybe it can do even more surgery in our hearts and uh, even a deeper work in us. And so I want to invite you to turn uh, to Isaiah 53. Um, so we, we started uh, a series um, or I say series. We just started teaching through the book of Isaiah. Um, no, I'm sorry, not Isaiah, Luke. some weeks ago, and uh, Lord willing, <laughs> we will eventually find ourselves back there. Uh, and it just again um, goes to show that we really do have to be, you know, kind of submitted to um, what God is doing, you know, because we can have things kind of all neatly mapped out and, and uh, you know, kind of had an idea in my mind of where I would have wanted uh, to be by this point, because Luke is long, you know, so, I mean, we're going to probably be there forever, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and so I was hoping to have made a lot more ground. Um, but, you know, again, in the, in the spirit of not living and speaking higher than what we actually live, I want to be sensitive to the spirit. And I want to be sensitive to the voice of the Lord. And I don't want to just be so committed to a regimen um, that when I feel that still small voice poking and prodding and saying, uh, uh, that's, that's not what I want you to put before the believers today. I want you to do this other thing, um, that I would, I would be yielded to that and, and open to that. And so, um, and so I believe the Lord did that to me again, um, this week and something that I wanted to put before us that I believe he's put on my heart to put before us. And I really want the Lord to make Tammy's prayer for us real, that we would be um, changed by what it is that is going to be said today. Um, because I, I really do feel like it perhaps is um, amongst the most important truths and things that we can learn and that we can hear from the Lord and that we all need to hear. 
and um, I want to honesty with God. I want to talk about honesty with God. And uh, if I can uh, enlist the help of my daughter here <laughs> really quick. Sweetheart, if you could just pass those out to everybody to have a copy of. And uh, this is all um, kind of being led by God. And so uh, thank you, dear. So just kind of bear with me um, in, in trying to pull all this together and pray with me and pray for me. Um, and as we work our way through. Uh, but in Isaiah 53, there's a verse there. So this, of course, is well known, a well known passage as the, the place where it, uh, the prophet Isaiah speaks about the Messiah um, who is going to come and to uh, deliver and, and rescue the people. And he gives this absolutely incredible description of Christ um, because when we when we see the description in Isaiah 53 he would not be a first round draft pick by any stretch based on how Isaiah lays him out and, and puts him out there and in fact he even says like there's nothing about this Messiah that's going to come, this suffering servant, there's, there's nothing about him that would make us desire him. You know, I mean, there's nothing about his external appearance, nothing about his, his uh, outward person or whatever that would just cause people's eyebrows to raise. He was really going to be, in a lot of external ways, a very ordinary person. But even though he was going to be this extraordinary person, he was going to be extraordinary in so many different ways. And primarily the ways that he was going to be extraordinary would not be related to his outward appearance or his external characteristics, but the things that were going to be absolutely extraordinary about this individual was going to be his character the kind of person that he actually was on the inside. And so there's all these different characteristics that Isaiah talks about that are unique about this person, about Jesus, about his character. But there's this one in particular that I want to lift out of all these because it is related to the very thing that I want to put before us today and it's found in verse 9 and it says after Isaiah has already been talking about all these other realities about him and what's going to happen to him and he's going to be cut off out of the land and he's uh, going to be oppressed and afflicted and all these various things then he gets to this characteristic in verse 9 of Isaiah 53 he says and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death although he had done no violence and what there was no deceit in his mouth there was no deceit in his mouth. He always spoke forth that which was true. And one of the primary expressions of integrity and honesty about an individual, the, the primary evidence 
of that being a reality on the inside is directly connected to what we speak and to what we say and to our conversation when we interact with people and the things that come out of our mouth. That is a, that is a direct, very manifest expression of the disposition of our end of inside lives as to whether we are operating and walking in honesty and integrity versus whether we're walking in deceit and secrecy. And so, what does this have to do with us? Well, I want to take us now to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Because I want to make this connection that, unfortunately, I believe and I feel is a connection that is not made enough. And I've even asked the Lord to help give me clear perspective about my own life and about my own ministry. And not only the way that I look at my life, but the way that I interact with other people in terms of what I'm pushing them towards. I've been asking the Lord, Lord, help me be more conscious of this, this reality and this principle and this fact. And what is that? It is the reality that Christ is not just our Savior and our Lord, which are truths that we love and that we embrace and that we celebrate. But that's not the whole picture. The other picture is, as Romans 8 tells us, that part of God's reason for sending Christ to die for us and to save us and to rescue us is so that we might be conformed into that very same image. And I think we forget that sometimes. That is not just telling people God loves you and he wants to save you and he wants to wash away your sins and he wants to forgive you of all your guilt. And all of those things are absolutely right and true. But that's not the end of the story. Not only does he want to do that, but he also wants to conform you into the image of Christ. So he doesn't just want to wash away your sins. He wants to change how you think. He wants to change how you live, how you talk, how you act. He wants your entire life. He doesn't just want to save you and wash away your sins and pat you, pat you on the bottom and say, OK, run along now and go live how you want to live. No, he says, yes, I want to save you. I want to bring you into my kingdom. But that's not the end of the story. In my doing that, I want to make you into looking like Jesus. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to work in your life and at every place and at every area in your life where you're not like Christ, I want to get rid of that. And I want to replace those areas with Christ likeness. And this is one of those areas that God wants to work in all of our lives as his children where we don't just read Isaiah and marvel and say, oh, wow, look at our Savior, look at our Lord who has no deceit in his mouth. No, God doesn't just want it to stop there. He wants to say, okay, now, Jamie and Tammy and Deron and Chris and, and Britton and the family, I want you guys to live with no deceit in your mouth. I want you guys to be just like my son would. This is the way the characteristics that you see in him. That's what I want to be characteristic of your life, Sierra. And so we see this here. One of the ways that this happens that's also neglected, unfortunately, in much of Western preaching is because people hear messages like this and then they go out and they say, okay, I heard what the preacher said there, and so now I'm going to roll my sleeves up, and I, I'm going to force this thing to happen. That always happens. Right now, that's happening. People are hearing these truths, and already they're thinking, okay, I got to do better. I got to do more. I got to work harder. I got to do this. I got to do that. And, and while it is true that the Lord does want to change us and make a difference in us, the way that he does that is not going to be through self-effort. 
and the arm of the flesh and us working ourselves up into this ability to now conform ourselves into the image of Christ, we, we can't do it. That was the fallacy and the, and the, 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 the um, lack of ability of the old covenant. Not that the law was bad. The law was perfect. The issue was the people. We couldn't obey it. <laughs> we couldn't keep it. But thank God, now that Christ has come and he's died and he's raised again, not only has he washed away all of our sins and how many just praise God the guilt of our sins is gone. Is it good? You know, as a Christian, when you get up in the morning, none of your sins are against you. That's a good feeling to know. <laughs> <laughs> None of my sins are against me. That's a great feeling. But that's not it, beloved. Christ didn't die just for that. But the, the scripture says somewhere there in Acts where the, the apostles are preaching and they're saying that he's opened up now th this, this new life. And they're going around preaching the words of this new life. And the writer in Hebrews talks about, I think somewhere maybe there in nine or somewhere in that neighborhood, where he talks about now that this new and living way has been opened up. And, and what is this new and living way? It's this new life and this new way of doing things that's not by the letter, but it's by the spirit of God working and moving in his people transforming and changing us from the inside out, not from the outside in, like with the old covenant. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, as he's been talking about now his ministry, he's saying, God has made me a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he's not made me a minister of the old covenant. The old way of doing things, which was according to the letter. But he says, now God has made me a minister of the new covenant. Which is by the spirit. And so he says these words beginning in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 3. He says, now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we are with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For what does this come from? The Lord who is what? Spirit. That transformation of going from being an individual that whose mouth used to be full of deceit. All of us were that way. We all came from pagan backgrounds and pagan lifestyles where our mouths were full. We were lying to people all the time. That's all that came out of our mouth was lies. And it was usually to advantage ourselves. We'd lie in the interview so we would look better than the other candidates. We'd lie to some girl to get a date. We'd lie to our parents so we can get out of the house and go to that party. Our mouths were full of deceit. That's the, that's the stock that we all come from. But now that we're in Christ, God doesn't again just say, okay, now I want to forgive you for all those lies you told, which again, thank God that he does it. Because some of us got a, real, a whole lot of lies that needed to be covered by the blood. But he says, not only do I want to cover those in my blood, but now I want to go to work in your heart, in your life, in your mind, in your spirit to actually now make you practically an individual who practices telling the truth. Who now on a day to day, -to -day basis goes to lunch with somebody and you sit across from them and you say, OK, by the spirit of God, I'm going to interact with this individual where there's not going to be deceit in my mouth. I'm going to speak with integrity and truth to this person. And before you say, well, hey, Chris, you know, that all sounds good or whatever, but that's just not possible. Well, let's read further, going right into 2 Corinthians, beginning at verse 1 and, and 4, 
chapter four, verse one, Paul says, therefore, in light of the reality that as we behold the glory of the Lord, that we get transformed from one degree of glory to another by the spirit. In light of that reality, Paul says this, therefore, having this ministry of the spirit by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. Paul says we've renounced it. He goes further. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. We refuse to. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience, conscience in the sight of God. And so you know what Paul is saying there? It's possible. Paul was no super saint. In fact, he, he would be the first one at the front of the line to tell all the believers, all this that you see me doing, you know, he would often say many places. He's, he writes in one letter, he says, I outran all the other, all these other ministers. I outran all of them. But right on the heels of that, he says, but yet it wasn't me. But it was the grace of God working through me. Right. Paul knew where it came from. He knew that he wasn't some super saint, you know, that had something that anybody else wasn't able to receive and to be able to accomplish by God's grace. And that's why I just love his humility. You read his letters and he's writing to the believers and he's saying, oh, pray for me, guys. Pray for me that I might speak as I ought or, or pray for me that, I, that I'll keep going. With. I mean, it was just it's so amazing. I love that. This is the Apostle Paul speaking in this way. And most of the pastors and ministers that I know here, it's like they got to, you know, I don't, can't have anybody thinking that I'm weak. You know, or that I don't know something. I always got to look like I'm on. I always got to be one step above somebody else. No sense of humility. No sense of brokenness. I was just at a retreat here recently, and I was in kind of this open room. They were setting up, and I guess there was this, um, this horn that was called, um, gosh, even now I forget the name of it, so far. And... Um, they had asked me as we were, you know, they were planning and kind of what was going to be taking place over the thing. One of the individuals asked me, like, you know, would you be willing to blow the shofar? And I said, what's that? And he said, you don't know what a shofar is? And you're a pastor? And I'm like, yeah, that's right. I'm a pastor. And I don't know what a shofar is. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't have it all together. You know, I learned that day what a shofar was. But we're all human. I mean, we're, we're all growing in this thing together. And listen, anything that we do know, anything that we do learn, any ground that we've been able to make, it's all been by the grace of God. Amen. Every little bit of it. Amen. So that nobody can strut around and boast. <laughs> Look what I know. God showed you that if you know it. And so more to what I want to share with us today because it is possible to live lives of, of integrity and transparency and honesty before the Lord. It's possible. Paul said it. He and his traveling companions they said we have renounced those kind of ways and we refuse to live and speak and operate in less than in, in a spirit of integrity and an attitude of integrity. And so that lets me know that it's possible. And Paul himself told us how it's possible. We don't have to manufacture this. God can do it by his spirit. So. Here's what I want to say to us. Transformation, beloved, starts with transparency. And until we get honest with ourselves and with God, then we will continue living powerless, false reality and living in a false universe that is destined to crash and burn one day. I really want you to let that sink in. Whenever we live and operate 
in the in the realm of deceit and the realm of deception we're the only ones who are losing out you know we're the ones who suffer in that and and what we end up doing is we end up giving our our life and our time and, and our efforts, I mean, we, we end up allowing those things to really be thrown to the wind. Because anything that is not of truth, anything that is not of integrity, the, the purifying fire of God is going to burn those things away. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul warns that we got to be careful how we build because those who build with wood, hay, and stubble, he says when we go before the testing fires of the Lord, those things are going to burn up. And so whenever we live and we operate and we speak in deceit, what we're doing is we actually are sowing and building with wood, hay, and stubble that ultimately in the end, in a second, is going to burn up. Whereas, conversely, if in those moments we could have operated with honesty and integrity and transparency, the fruit that could have been born from that, that would last and that would abide, that would remain. And so, unfortunately, because I want this to start with all of us first. Unfortunately, the reason why we never get to those transformative places in our lives is because of our own lack of honesty between ourselves and the Lord. That's where it starts. You know, I gave you guys that handout there and it talks about honesty with others and honesty you know, of course, with God and then with ourselves. But, but that's, that's the first rung. Until we learn how to first and foremost be honest with ourselves and be honest with God, then we'll never make progress. We'll never be able to, to get into that realm of... Um, transformation because God deals you guys can check those out later um, but just zero in on what's being said God, God deals in the realm of, of integrity I was sharing this with somebody recently I can't remember who it was but I gave the, them this analogy it's kind of like you know you get God sitting down at a table and there you are across from him and he's like okay you know uh, you know what, what are we going to do here and then you start saying things but you know the thing about God is he sees the heart unlike anybody else I can sit across from him and we can have a whole conversation and I can feel totally differently than what I'm communicating to him and he may not ever know that because he can't see inside but God sees inside and so he would still sit there and have this conversation with me the whole time because he's assuming the best. It's not that way with God. God is sitting there and he's like, OK, you ready to talk? And we start talking and it's like, OK, he gets up and he walks away. He's like, OK, he comes back. OK, are you ready to be honest? You know, well, not this, that, and OK, nope. <laughs> Because regardless of the words that are coming out of our mouth, he sees right into the heart. And he says, I see you talking to me, but I see your heart is totally somewhere else. And so when you're ready to get honest and when you're ready to be deal with me truthfully, now we can have a conversation and you got my full attention and we can get somewhere. But until you're ready to come to the table with that level of commitment, OK, I'll just find somebody else who's who's ready and willing to deal honestly, honestly with me. This is what holds Christians back. This is what holds churches back. This is what holds relationships back. Some, some relationships right now are, could just experience a massive breakthrough they'll never be able to because there's not a sense of transparency and honesty. And so there's just, you go 20 years in this false reality, this made up universe 
and there's 20 elephants in the room and you just, you know, squeeze around them. And you go 20 years that way. No breakthrough. No difference being made. No transformation. No opportunity to lay the tracks for God to just come in like a mighty rushing wind and do business there. Why? Because we won't get honest. God deals in honesty. God deals in transparency. You know, one of the reasons why we had the amazing meeting that we did and all that singing and praise and honor going up, I wholeheartedly believe God has purified this church. And we're not perfect individuals by any stretch of the imagination, but I believe that we come, even now this message, even though it's tweaking some of you all, you're like, okay, Lord, I tweak me so I can be better. And so I believe that's the very environment by which God can work. And that's why his spirit hovers over us. And you look at other churches and they're singing these glorious songs and you look and there's hundreds of people and they're stuck and they're stiff and can't move. No freedom. Why is that? Because there's all kinds of hypocrisy and secrets and, and God doesn't operate in environments like that. He doesn't visit places where all kinds of secrets are being held. People are standing right next to people they can't stand. And really, no wonder you can't lift your hands and praise God. You think God's going to inspire that in you and you hate the person next to you? He desires truth in the inward parts. And so that's why a lot of churches, it's all pomp and circumstance and the guy's got to have a, a, a well-manicured beard and, and, and speak just the right way and there's got to be lights and camera and action. Why, why do you need all that? Because God's spirit isn't there. And so we got to manufacture something to make people feel like something's happening. Well, all they got to do is just get real and get honest and the glory the Lord will come down and you won't have to blast out everybody's ears because he desires truth that's why I don't know where this will go but maybe somebody who needs to hear it will hear it you know recently the, the church here in the city they had this prayer meeting or whatever and I just couldn't bring myself to go because I know that there's, personally, I know areas where there's lack of integrity and there needs to be confession. And it's an abomination to me and my estimation to God to go before. Jamie made me remember this last year, those meetings. And at the end of it, they call all the pastors up there. I was probably the only pastor out of, who knows, 50 or whatever, who didn't go up there. And that's not because I'm some, you know, great man. But I just, I know that God deals with integrity and honesty. And I don't care how many people are in there. I'm not going to go in there and hold hands when I know God's not pleased. He desires truth in the inward part. That's why I say we teach and live and speak way higher than we actually or we teach and believe and sing and all that higher than we live. Even in our own lives. Can we even be honest with our own kids? Is there deception and deceit there? And so, the final piece to this is that it's not simply even about being honest, but the most important step is where our heart goes with what, ha it's, it's where, what happens next after that. And what do I mean by that? It's not enough just to confess. For instance, it's not just enough to confess, Lord, lust is in my heart. It's not enough just to confess that. Do you really want God to take that out? Or do you want to treasure it and keep it? And you think there's some kind of virtue, oh, because I confess it. You got to get rid of that thing. And do you want to? You know? It's enough, oh, Lord, I, you know, I know, you know my life is yours and you want me to go wherever you want and I, I just confess that I'm not there right now. Okay, are you willing to be made willing? Amen. Are you going to be like Jonah, kill me instead of me being on, in obedience to you? Wow. 
so for some, the first step is just to begin being honest and confessing our true heart condition. But for others, it's not just the confession part, but the next step is what are you actually going to do with the reality of what you've confessed and acknowledged? Are you going to repent of it or are you going to hold on to it and refuse to repent? Lord, I confess that I am jealous at times or I confess that I'm this at times. Okay, God's not, you know, he sees everything. He know. I mean, so that's, you know, I mean, that doesn't scare, scare him. Like, oh, wow, you're a jealous person? That doesn't, I mean, he's saying, okay, I, my sin can cover that. My spirit can give you the grace to overcome that. Do you want to be overcome? Do you want it to be overcome? Just like he said to that one individual, do you want to be healed? Okay, if you want to be healed, take up your mat. Oh, no, no. You want to hold on to your mat? And that's the case with some. They want to hold on to the mat. They don't want to let it go. No freedom then. And so they play the victim card. Do you want to be free? Do you want to be healed? Okay, God has said, I've got the power to heal you. So the place we all have to be, beloved, at the last, is here. Lord, you can take my health. You can take my children. You can take my money. You can take my opinions. You can take my reputation. You can take my physical life. As long as I have you, I'm okay. That's where we got to be at the last. And most, if they're honest, are not there yet. But that's the place where we have to be most honest about. Because even if we're not there, the question is, are we truly willing to be made by God to be there? I've been there. I'm human just like you all are. I've had to say to the Lord, Lord, right now you're calling me to do this particular thing and really I, everything in me does not want to do that. But the disposition of my heart that the Lord is looking for is, okay, are you willing for me to deal with that and to take your unwillingness and to make it into willingness? You got pride? Okay, I see that. Are you willing to let me smash your pride and make you humble? That's what the Lord is asking. Okay, I know the struggles that you have. Are you willing to let me, by my spirit, come in and take all that garbage out and sweep the house up? And as Jamie said in his prayer earlier, let me fill you and seal it. Are we willing for that? That's the real question. That's the real, at the end of the day, are we willing? And that's we all got to get honest with the Lord. Because if we are not, whatever we think we are building upon is a sham because the Bible is clear that those are the terms of following Christ. Jesus said it in Luke 14, 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Those to me are two absolutely staggering words in that one verse. All and cannot. If you are not willing to renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. You can't. He doesn't say you can just be a second or third or fourth string Christian. That's not the terms. He says you're not even in this thing if you're not willing to agree to those terms. 
It's not that you'll just be a lesser person in the kingdom. He's saying, according to that verse, you're not even in the kingdom. If you haven't come to those to agreement with those terms, you're still on the outside of these things. Even if you're right up to the edge, like that one guy in Mark 12, where Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom. He was right on the cusp of the kingdom. But you know what? He's still disqualified. You can be right on the edge of the line right there. But if you're not in, it's disqualified. And when Christ comes back to rescue all, the only people that he's taken are the people who are on that other end of their line. And so even if you're right there, I think that's what it is. It's going to be for so, so many people. Well, all right, we were right there. We were right here near you. you yeah, but you, here's the line and here's where you are. Still on the outside of this thing. Just like the rich young ruler. Well, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Okay, here's that one other thing that I want. That brought him right here. Mmm. Mmm. All my money, Lord. Mmm. To the poor. Oh, well, maybe this will be good enough. He'll just let me be a second rate Christian. I'll just go through life and do my thing. And then when the end comes and they find out, he says, I never knew you. What? What do you mean, Lord? I was right there on the edge. Yeah, but you never fully surrendered. And so whatever you thought you had with me was a sham. And so I've made a first consecration to live this way in my own life. And to start correcting my own life more to conform to God's will for me in this area. I've, I've started with me, beloved. And, and, and all these things and messages like this. And this, this has really been my biggest prayer, especially this morning. And just in anticipation of putting this before you all. Is Lord, let them only see themselves in this. Not their neighbor, not somebody else. Lord, help me to put myself on the witness stand. Just, just me and God in the throne room. And me and God working and hashing all this stuff out. And making a determination, I'm not leaving this room until me and God come to terms. And then when we do that, when we walk out of that room, now we can relate to the whole world the way that God has called us to. Because now we're free. And we can speak truth. And we can sit across from the person that we love the most in this world and say, you know what? As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. And if I got to watch your back, so be it. If I got to watch you walk away from me, you know what? Christ has said, nobody who's left houses, lands, mother, father, whatever, won't get much more in this life and then eternal life and the life to come. You know what that means? You have spouses or parents or children or nephews or nieces leave you from a natural standpoint. Guess what? God will give you a whole family. We can go to China somewhere and folks there find out, oh, you're, you're a brother? You're a believer? Come on in. Let me make you something to eat. We got a nice little bed for you. It's not much, but it's for you. You're a brother. That's what that passage means. So nothing that we lose in this life from a natural standpoint, God isn't able to replace in the spiritual. And he's promised that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He never said that it wouldn't be hard. He never said that it wouldn't be difficult. He never said that we wouldn't cry. He never said that the sword wouldn't come in our life on the count of our testimony and our allegiance to him. But what he has promised is that I will never leave you nor forsake you. He has promised that. He has promised I'll be with you to the end of the age. He has promised that. Do you believe it? I don't know. And 
so that's where the Lord has had me. That's how he's been dealing with me. And my prayer is that he would deal with all of us in the same way. Because for however far we've come, there's deeper still. <laughs> for however much he's purified our lives, there's still some stuff that still got to go. We might have all those closets cleaned out, but it's like, okay, we got that done. Now we got to go up to the attic. <laughs> Got the attic cleaned out, okay, now there's the shed, <laughs> right? I mean, it just keeps on. It, there's always deeper still. We never arrive until we draw our last breath or until Christ cracks that sky and comes back to get us. Until one of those two things happens, we are still always got deeper still to go, more to go, more ground to take. But he's promised to not leave us nor forsake us and to be with us. But his terms that he deals with us on is integrity and honesty. And so he's there at the table saying, I'm ready. When you're ready to come to me and be honest about your fears and your failures and your hangups and the areas that you aren't like me, that you need to be like me, and your desire to not want to let those areas go, until you're, until you're willing to come to me and lay all that out on the table and get honest with me so that I can begin to transform you. Until you're ready to do that, you're just going to be living your life in a false reality. And you'll be sitting across the table talking, but there won't be anybody there. You know, the Lord says that he, he doesn't hear the prayers of those who regard iniquity in their heart. I didn't, Chris didn't say that. The word of God says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. Yeah, he hears you, obviously, because he sees everything. But he doesn't hear you in the way that it's going to matter, where it's going to be effectual. I want, I want that for me. I want that for you all. I want us to be a church where anytime anybody comes in there, whoever it might be, they know, wow, we're amongst some people there. There's no guile in them. These are people of integrity. They're going to speak the truth. I may not like what they have to say, and I may have a response. I may never come back. <laughs> but one thing I can say about those folks over there, they speak the truth. They walk in the truth. They live the truth. And we do it before we close and pray. We do it not in self-righteousness. You know, the self-righteous arrogance. That's not what I'm talking about. We do it with broken-hearted humility, recognizing our own weaknesses and frailties. Listen, whenever we got to call somebody else to account, we don't do it like, you know, you better get right because, hey, you know, no, we, we do it like, hey, brother, sister, I'm weak like you, but God has been at work in my life to help me overcome. And so I'm encouraging you, repent, turn, God can help you overcome too. So we do it recognizing and conscious of our own weaknesses and frailties, you know. It's not like, hey, I got it together, so why don't they have it together? That's not what I'm talking about. Honesty with God. So how about we, uh, we sing and um, if you like to come and grab uh, something there for one of the elements you're welcome to and at the end of the song we will uh, I'll ask you Jamie to pray and, and we'll consider ourselves dismissed so